What's up, fisher people? I'm gonna do something a little different that I don't do that often, and that is I'm gonna focus on about everything except for the fishing today. If I catch fish, I'm gonna count that as a bonus, but I'm gonna pay attention more to graphing, uh, equipment, presentations, locations, all of those technical things that sometimes I'm not great at talking about. So first of all, we're gonna talk about gear here. And the two things that I like to do most in the fall are jigs and minnows if the fish are biting. If the fish are feeding well, a jig and a minnow is a great way to catch fish. It's a super fun way to catch fish. If I'm jigging, I'm always using six and a half to seven foot medium light fast. That's the ticket for me. I like to use the high vis braid so that I can see the line, especially if I'm getting bites, I can see the line jump, or if I can just see if I got slack, or if my line's tight, all that kind of stuff. I didn't bring any bait today, so today we're not gonna do that. But I love to do that if the fish are biting well. If the fish are not biting super well, sometimes you have to trigger a bite. One way to do that is trolling crankbaits. Lead core trolling can be super effective, I do it a fair amount, but it's not my go-to. I don't think it's the most enjoyable way to catch fish personally. I like to catch fish feeling the bite. So we're not gonna talk about lead core today. Of course, we're gonna talk about snap jigging, jigging wraps, all that kind of stuff. If I'm doing a snap jigging presentation, I definitely want a seven foot rod, seven, seven, two, something like that. You want a lot of length for a lot of leverage to whip that thing around. I want, if I'm using braid, I want a medium fast or extra fast. If I were using mono, I'd probably go to a medium heavy rod to get that thing moving in the water a little better because mono stretches so much. So you really got to crank it to get the lure to jump and to get it to move. You want to have something that feels very light in your hand yet still has the power to move the bait because it can be a very exhausting way to fish if you're jig wrapping all day long. So you want it to be comfortable so it needs the strength that when you crack it, you get that thing to move, but you're not exhausted by doing it. So the lighter the rod is, the better it moves through the air, the more wind resistant it is, the thinner it is, all that kind of stuff. But it still has to be medium with braid, medium heavy probably with mono. And you want fast or extra fast action so that that tip bends to snap the bait, but also you've got some give up there to keep a fish pinned. And another thing that I wanna dabble with that I haven't yet is with the reel. Again, you want a fairly light reel, but there's also some spinning reels now that have a higher gear ratio because when you get fish way out on a cast on these things, especially if they wind up hitting it and chasing it in and charging you, it's hard to get that line tight on the fish real quick and keep them pinned and keep them on. And a higher gear ratio will pick up line a lot quicker so you see me a lot of times in videos where I'll hook a fish and I'll reel like mad to try to get tight on the fish. If you have a higher gear ratio, you can get that fish tight quicker and that helps a lot. So in terms of spots for finding fall walleyes, there can be a lot of different types of structure, but the big key to me is having deep water nearby and having a steep break. It doesn't mean that there can't be a flat spot or a ledge on it, and that's probably preferable. You want something, a platform for those fish to sit on as opposed to just a sheer drop. But there needs to be a pretty steep break nearby and access to deep water. And you'll find that those fish tend to slide around or up and down that structure a lot during the day and as the wind changes. So if you're early in the day and or you got a lot of wind, they might push up further on top of that structure and if you got the opposite, they'll slide down deeper. So you could have fish anywhere from 15 to 60 feet 
on the same structure depending on their mood and depending on the conditions for that day. Now these sweet spots could be anything from humps and sunken islands to deep points to just a steep breaking shoreline with a nice shelf on it. Um, you might not have to pay so much attention to is it windswept the way you would, especially in spring and even in summer. Um, but you know, any day that the wind's moving and the water's moving and you got some current, that's always a good thing for the fishing. Now in terms of how to set up on these spots, boat position wise, um, if I'm spot locked, I want to be in a spot where A, preferably I'm casting downwind to keep my line tight, to feel the bite, and also to not get so much line twist on the top of the line. And I also want to be in a position where I can work up and down that structure or diagonally across it. Because again, if there's fish sitting in 25 feet, 32 feet, 38, 45, you want to be in a position where you can either cast up or down that structure and work your bait along there and come in contact with all those fish as they're sliding up and down that stuff. So if I were going to be on a shoreline where I'm seeing fish in a little bit of every spot, I like to be in the deepest spot where I can find fish so that if I'm working vertically, I can get to the deep fish. But I can also cast up shallow and contact those fish that are shallower. And I can get a little bit of everything that way. Now when I'm in a spot where I'm trying to work multiple depths, what I like to be able to do is, you know, unless I'm seeing a big stack of fish in one spot, I will spot lock. Otherwise, I like to keep slowly moving so that I can keep scanning and keep working an area, typically casting around there. Now your side imaging shows you a lot of stuff out to the side, but if you're not moving, it just shows you what's directly to the side of your boat and as fish swim through it. If you keep moving, however, you keep scanning and seeing new things. You keep shining that beam on new stuff, right? So if I'm moving along in, again, where I think the deepest part of where the fish will be, I can mark fish below me, but I can also see them out to the side on the side imaging and know where to cast. So I will literally sometimes just kind of troll along until I see fish either straight down or out to the side and then pitch out there and work those fish because again, jig wrapping can be a little tiresome and you want to be most as <laughs> you want to be the most efficient you possibly can be and save your energy when you got fish around. So I'll cruise along, maybe work the bait behind me. If I'm marking fish down, I start to see them on the side. I'll reel up quick and I'll pitch back to those fish. But always remember if you're moving, wherever your transducer is, that's where it marked the fish. And now that fish is behind the boat. So you're gonna to have to quarter your cast some distance behind the boat to come in contact with that fish and try to gauge how far ahead of them you might have gotten. If you're not so much worried about targeting specific fish on the graph, sometimes I'll just troll an area and I'll just keep casting at a 45 degree angle ahead of the boat and I'm just gonna work the heck out of it, keep casting, keep searching, and I start to use my bait as a search mechanism on top of what I'm doing with the sonar. Matter of fact, I just spotted some fish out to the left side of the boat, the port side, if you will, in a little shallower water. So I'm gonna make a toss out there and see if I can run in contact with them. See if I can get them to go. I'm driving the boat in 25. Those fish look like they're in about 20. The wind's blowing a little bit, so they might be walleyes up there. They also could be carp. They also could be pike. You know, who knows what exactly they are. But if you don't cast out of them, you're not going to catch them, right? Now, when it comes to technique, again, we're focusing on the jigging wrap today as we're fishing. The biggest thing that you have to do is you got to remember that the purpose of the jigging wrap is to trigger a bite. If the fish are feeding heavily, you don't need a jigging wrap to catch them. If they're not, you got to get their attention and you got to make them instinctively react to it. And you're not going to get that done by just lifting this thing up and following it down. This is not getting a fish's attention. What gets their attention is quick, snappy movements. You gotta crack that thing hard and get it to jump, and then you gotta let it fall on a slack line so that it flutters down. That's what's getting the fish's attention. It's the same thing with crankbait trolling. When you're trolling a crankbait at two mile an hour, it's got a lot of wobble, it's got a lot of flash, it's maybe got some noise, but it's moving fast. 
it forces them to make a decision. Do I want that or not? So if you're reaction fishing, it's got to be quick. It's got to be snappy. It's got to be sudden. You can't, I, and I know that takes a lot of time and effort to do. I realize it's an exhausting way to fish. And if it is, you should probably do something else, honestly. You should troll crankbaits. You should see if they're biting the jigs because this usually only works if you're snapping it good. Now that said, it doesn't mean they have to be big, long snaps and big, long sweeps. Typically, if the fish are a little more active, you know, we're still sitting at 63 degree water temps. Fish are gonna be pretty active yet. So the big, long crack and sweep is probably a good bet. But sometimes it just takes a little pop and just move it, you know, like a foot at a time instead of five or six feet at a time. But you still want it to be snappy. You still want it to be poppy. You still want it to be quick and you still want it to fall in a slack line a hundred percent. So play with that a little bit. You know, sometimes do a double pop. Sometimes just do these little hops. Sometimes let it sit on the bottom a little more before your next hop to give them a chance to hone in on it and decide if they want to bite it or, you know, maybe they're not quite aggressive enough to completely chase it, but they'll come and look at it if they have a moment, you know? Now, in terms of casting versus say trolling and ripping, you know, both of them keep the bait moving, but for whatever reason, I tend to have a lot more success with casting them on a lot of days. Part of that could be just getting it away from the boat. You know, the fish might be a little skittish, they might be a little spooky, and they might not want to hit something that's right underneath a boat. And that can, you know, be the same thing if you're in 20 feet of water or even 40 feet, depending on the day. I mean, I've had days where it's, I'm in 40 feet of water, but it's pretty calm out. And I get on top of fish and three seconds later, they're gone. And they just don't want you sitting on them. So if you're having a hard time getting bites, if you're marking fish after fish after fish and you're just ripping it underneath the boat, not getting any bites, you might have to start casting it. Then there's also the vertical presentation. If you got fish that are willing to sit still and they're holding on the structure pretty tightly, there are days where they'll bite really well, if not better, being straight vertical, straight up and down. But the principle and the concept's the same. You still want a quick snappy rip and you still want to play with, is it a short pop or is it a long crack to see what gets their attention and what they're willing to bite. And probably the last best tip that I can give people for fall fishing is that once you know where to find them, it's oftentimes not hard to find fish. They tend to hold on those structures we talked about. They tend to be fairly structure oriented. They also tend to hang out very close to river channels at this time. Fall fish start to kind of move. They start to do their migrations, especially out on the reservoir system. So if you can spot, find one of those spots, the humps, the points, the shelves, the shorelines, right next to a river channel, that's even better. That's a bonus. But once you've figured out where the fish are, it's often fairly easy to find them, fairly easy to mark them, not so easy to catch them. So again, that's where you have to figure out, is it a jig and a minnow? Is it a reaction bite? Is it a crankbait? And if you're on a pot of fish that just doesn't want to bite, some fish this time of year are just not very active, especially this early fall, this transition kind of period. Later fall, they'll be pretty darn active and you can catch them a lot better. This time of year might not be the case. So if that happens, move on. Find another pod, go to a different spot, slide 100 yards on the same spot and see if there's fish there. You'd be surprised how many times you go to a first pod, nothing, second pod, nothing, third. All of a sudden you get to the fourth pod of fish, first cast you get a bite second cast you get a bite and they're they're just active those are the fish that want to bite that time of day and the same thing goes for if you're on a pod that is biting and then all of a sudden they quit that's probably a good time to move on you might want to come back to that spot later if they're still there now that you know where there's fish give them a chance to take a break reload have more fish move in there or whatever but move on in the meantime and try something else it's kind of uh almost a, a hit and run sort of technique or a run and gun sort of thing where it's like you're moving around the lake a lot, finding lots of fish, giving them a quick opportunity. Are you gonna take it or not? 
with a reaction bite. If they don't take it right away, they're probably not going to take it after 20 or 30 casts either. If you were fishing in a tournament and you mark one really big fish and you know that's a really good fish down there and you need one hog as a kicker, maybe you try to just cast and cast and cast and beat that fish to death. But for the most part, if you're out recreational fishing, you're trying to get numbers, you're trying to get bites, three, four casts of the jigging wrap, especially if you got multiple people in the boat. If you don't get a bite, move on. They're not the right fish. Speaking of moving on, I've made like six or seven casts while I've been talking here on these fish and they haven't bit yet. So I'm out of here. I'm moving spots. <laughs> Found a pretty good looking spot here with a lot of marks. Some of them kind of down in 32, some of them kind of up in 28. With some good wind moving around here. I like to see that 28 to 32 is a good depth in the fall. Usually a fairly active depth as opposed to the, the 40 to 50 stuff where fish can be caught but can be a little bit tougher. So I'm gonna work these over a little bit. That was not what I was hoping for. <laughs> That's a baby white bass. That's bait. I did just see these marks down here behind me though. So I got over the marks I first found. I'm working to get just upwind of them. Spot lock, cast downwind. They've been sitting pretty still. And I can see them straight behind me as well as slightly out to the right a little deeper. So I'm gonna spot lock here. Make a couple casts straight back. Make a couple casts a little out to the side. See what we can do. Cast number two. This is cast number three. Nothing but the little white bass so far. I'm getting close to either sliding around to see if I need to reposition, see if those fish move, or just determining that these are not the right fish and it's time to keep moving on. I'm gonna give it a few more minutes, no more than five. If I don't get bit, we gone. Another logical question to ask would be, well, if you're a round fish, should you not just try changing baits, changing colors to trigger those bites? And I would say maybe, but if you're pretty dialed in on something, something that's been working for the last few days, and or you've already caught three or four fish on a certain bait with a certain color that day, I'd say you're better off continuing to move and find more fish that'll bite that rather than spend time tinkering around with what might get those specific fish to bite. Now, if you're on a lake that you're having a hard time finding fish and you've looked at 10, 15, 20 spots and that's the only place you can find them, yeah, you probably want to do everything in your power to see if you can get those particular fish to bite. And I have five empty casts here. I don't think these fish are going to go. I'm going to find some other ones that will. I got a pretty good pot of them straight down in 33 to 35. So I'm going to work these vertically for the time being, see if I can get those. If I don't get them vertically, sometimes I'll push the boat out a little bit and pitch back to them as well, just to see if that helps trigger a bite a little better with, um, with the boat not sitting right on top of them. But it's worth a shot since they're right here. The other question then becomes too, if you don't have a camera, are they walleyes or catfish or the only other fish that I see that schools up a lot like this on similar spots is catfish. So I've had times where the jigging wrap's not getting anything and I'll put down a night crawler on a jig or a drop shot, catch a couple catfish. Then you know. So no takes so far. I'm definitely gonna move around. But this is a pretty big spot. It's a, a really big sunken island right next to the old river channel. 
and I'm pretty sure it's going to hold a lot of fish all around the entire island. So I don't necessarily need to move and leave the island entirely. I'm just going to keep sliding around looking for new pods of fish. And I'm going to drop my bait on every pod along the way and see which ones will actually take it. So that's the plan. Well, I've gone four casts and I worked them vertically a little bit. I haven't had a bite yet. This is my fifth cast. Ooh, there's some nice bait fish. I'll get a screenshot of these bait balls. That's a cool thing. If I don't get a bite on this cast, though, I'm probably going to be gone. And I can see that bait both on the down imaging and side imaging, which is pretty neat. That's always a cool little thing. Being able to connect the dots as to what's on both screens there, I like that. And then I start thinking about bite windows. At some point, if you try, you know, eight or ten spots where you're marking fish and not getting them, it's like, well, this might be... Oh, I think I just had a rattle. This might be kind of a downtime for those fish. Maybe I got to wait for the right window. And then it becomes, you know, cycling back through those spots, waiting until the right time when they're willing to open up. Because you get a day where, like today, it's supposed to be 90 degrees and sunny in late September. That's not fall weather. That starts to reverse the fall feeding trend. That's where the jigging wrap can, becomes much better than jigging a minnow. And it's where you have to work your butt off to get a few bites kind of thing. So today could be a grind. Already has been a little bit of a grind. There we go. I slid around a little more on the same island and pitched out to the third pod that I saw and got a fish that wanted it, that bit it. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Not a big one, but he's an active fish, he bit. And now we might have a spot to work. First cast on the spot, by the way. That's how you know. If you can get him on the first cast, you got a shot and then you might want to park there for a little while and I'm not saying an hour I'm saying give it another five ten minutes as opposed to two because it could just be a lone ranger one excited fish but if you can get two fish in short order then then things start to build you get a little momentum and you got a feeling that you're on the right pod of active fish. I do see some fish under the boat in 35. They may or may not go. I'll probably work it vertically for just a few pops and then I'll go cast way back there where I got that one. If I don't get a second one on the next cast, I might be out of here already. Two more empty casts, I'm gone. It's been a while, but we got another one on here. I've had to go to the whole uh, covering water method, essentially trolling and casting, and just going through as many fish as possible. And finally, this one took. That's kind of the way it is right now. But he's not a he's not a big one, and he's he's foul hooked for sure. But yeah, it's just about covering water, my goodness. Moving, covering water, going through a lot of spots. I like to get some cooler water times, not gonna lie. Definitely want some cooler water. 90 degrees is not helping the bite at all. But the plan and the method stays the same. It just becomes more of a grind. Go through more fish, go through more spots, keep at it. Spot locked on the same spot. Had a bump and a miss. And then got this one to bite. So like I said, 
every once in a while you find a pod of slightly active fish that you can actually spend some time and work and uh, this is the first this is the first pod we found today three bites two catches same little area after moving through so many different pods of fish that didn't bite at all so that's kind of the deal it will come it will happen even if it is slow in a grind and you know these aren't nice fish yet by any means but we're making the most out of what we can do here in a few hours this afternoon so I went back to some of those early spots from the morning like I said, I will recycle spots. That's a thing I'll do. Looks like he might be coming up a little high and wide. That's kind of a pikey thing to do. We'll see. We'll see what we got here. We'll see what's going on. That's not a pike. That's a side hooked Wally of decent proportions. Decent fat. Fall Sakakawea Wally. You snag them in the belly, they'll come in in all kinds of directions, right? But that's good to get a talking point about recycling spots. Could not get bites here earlier. Come back, fish it for five minutes, and get a bite. And that there is not a bad fall perky sock walleye. See ya. It's also worth noting, as I mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes if I go over marks, I will keep moving over them and then cast back to them once again when the boat's not over top of them. That's exactly what I did there. Rolled over some marks, was ripping through them, didn't get them to go. By the time I got probably 50 feet past them, I decided to lock the boat and cast back there. And first cast back on that spot, I got that fish. So there are a lot of tricks you can try. And sometimes one of those is just getting the boat away from them. They just don't want the boat on top of them. And you'll also probably notice I did switch to the purple. I wasn't having any, well I got the one small fish on the chrome perch and that was it. And then I switched her out to purple after lunch and every other fish has come on purple. Which, it's a fairly bright sunny day. Typically that chrome stuff will work better. But there's still some flash on the purple. It's got a little shine to it and seems to be the ticket today. So take it for what it's worth, y'all. Well, that's gonna wrap up this video. Hopefully you got something out of that. Hopefully it was educational. Like I said, I wanted to spend a little more time with the technical stuff today as opposed to just the fish catching stuff. And it can be a little tough to do both for sure. Hopefully that was worthwhile. And if you did like it, consider uh, hitting that like button and subscribing and watching more videos, checking out some of the archives and all that kind of stuff. And we'll see you in another one down the road for sure. Later.